I'm going to ask you to open your Bibles to uh, Matthew's sixth chapter. So I'm saying that now, and that, that gives you a few minutes. How's that? But if you get to the New Testament, you know, Matthew's the first book, so you can get there. But let me, I want to talk to you this, this morning. You, you, most of you will know, and those of you who are tuning in, maybe for the first time or, or for the first time in a while, uh, you, you will now recognize that we are in the midst of a series that we call uh, Learning to Pray, or if we direct it directly to our Lord, we say, teach us to pray. We want to be in the school a prayer, however you want to put that. And we had dealt with a variety of, of issues already. We talked about, you know, praying for deeper understanding, uh, praying uh, also that we may, may have greater power, praying that we will have spiritual breakthrough, praying uh, that we would uh, understand who God truly is. And, and, uh, and now today we're going to ask uh, the Lord to teach us about praying when we face all kinds of worries. What does that mean? And next, next Sunday, we're going to look at what it means to pray us uh, through uh, difficult storms of our lives. You know, to worry, there's nothing new about that. Uh, all the way through human history, people have worried. They, they used to worry about food and, and will there be some... Uh, animals to, to catch when I'm hunting that I may be able to eat? Will there be uh, enough shine, sunshine and, and water to, to, to make the soil fertile enough where I can eat what I have sown? Uh, worries about illnesses when, when things are coming through our little village, uh, will we be so sick that we die or will we be able to survive when these things are, are coming our way? Uh, will we be secure uh, either from from uh, thugs and thieves or from, uh, you know, warring tribes that want to come and, and burn our place down and on and on and on. There's worries is something that has characterized humans, say, you know, from, from uh, almost the beginning, we would say. But it is a luxury of our generation that we worry about being worried, that we get stressed out about being stressed. It, you know, we have developed all kind of expertise in how to solve the fact that we worry about being worried. We have whole degrees programs where people can take degrees in helping us to get through that thing. And, and we know nowadays, and, and, and please don't mishear me, I'm not trying to make light of any of that. You know, there are deep, deep issues with, with mental illness and, and with identity crisis. We're not sure who we are and how to understand ourselves, and we compare ourselves to what we see on TikTok or Snapchat or, or Twitter or Instagram or other things, and, and we can't quite get there, so we worry and we get into depressive states and, and all that. There, there's so much going on these days in this field and books are being written from just about every angle you can imagine. Companies are sending their CEOs on, on special kind of courses where they can learn how to channel their worry and their fear into something productive. Normal people are willing to pay really good money to go to some resort where someone tells you to lay still on a mat where they can put two stones on your forehead and two cucumbers on your eyelids <laughs> to overcome your worries. Some get worries that they have wrinkles in their face that show that they were not born yesterday. We worry about a lot of things. Worry, really, when you think about it, is that one's mind dwells on the difficulties that may potentially come. So if you're worried this morning, you're not alone. A lot of people are worried. And if that is you, listen to Jesus when he gives us the final word. Most of everything that we hear about these things try to deal with the symptoms of worry. Jesus is grabbing on to the very root cause. 
of it all. I'm going to begin uh, reading from verse 24. Most of you would think I might have begun with verse 25 if you look at your scripture where you have that section. But this comes in a flow in scripture. Jesus had just taught his, his uh, disciples to pray. They say, Lord, teach us to pray. It begins early in chapter 6. Then he goes on to talk about fasting and how to do that with joy. Then he goes on to talk about, about, about the treasures, the true treasures that, that are found in heaven and not on earth. And he talks about no one can serve two masters. And then comes this teaching about worries and anxiety. So uh, if you look here in verse 24 of the sixth chapter of Matthew, this is what Jesus says. No one can serve two masters since either he will hate one and love the other or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and mammon. Therefore, therefore, now let me tell you this. Don't worry about your life, what you'll eat or what you'll drink or about your body, what you'll wear. Isn't life more than food and isn't body more than clothing? Consider the birds of the sky. They don't sow, they don't reap, they don't gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Aren't you worth more than they? Can any of you add one moment to his lifespan by worrying? And why do you worry about your clothes? Observe how the wildflowers of the field grow. They don't labor, they don't spin threads. Yet, I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was adorned like one of these. If that's how God clothes the grass of the field which is here today and thrown into the furnace tomorrow, won't he do much more for you? Oh, you little faith. So don't worry, saying, what will we eat? Or what will we drink? Or what will we wear? For the Gentiles eagerly seek these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be provided for you. Therefore, don't worry about tomorrow, because tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble in its own. You know, this is a powerful, powerful text. As I just mentioned, Jesus is grabbing a hold of the very root issue of worry. He's pointing not to symptoms, but to how do you find healing from that. And I want to just kind of highlight this, that he brings a message that is as simple as it is deep. And here's the issue with that. We all say that's too simple but it's often, friends, the simple messages that are the easiest to understand than the more, and the more difficult to implement in your life. So here it is, and I want you to kind of write this down. The way to lose a smaller worry is to subordinate it to a higher, to a greater, to an ultimate Word. Can I say that again? The way to, to overcome, if you will, or to lose a, a smaller worry or concern is to subordinate it to a greater or a higher, even an ultimate word. And that's not easy. In fact, Paul uses language to talk about that. In, in Romans chapter 12, he says, you need to change your mind. It is a renewal of the mind, a different way of thinking about reality. And that's difficult. That is difficult. So let us get back to the text and just kind of look at it for a moment. And, you know, it is so easy to misunderstand when Jesus says, don't worry about your life. And, and just misunderstanding that to, 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 as if we should be uninterested or disinterested. 
But that's not what Jesus is saying. He is not saying, he is not saying don't care anything about your life and what you're eating and what you're drinking and, or, or what you should dress yourself in. He is not encouraging indifference. He's not some, some kind of uh, new agey kind of guy that, that, that just say, pull yourself out of this world and find you in a balance. In fact, when that text says, do not worry for anything in life, that word, worry, that we translate worry, if you break that down, it really means to divide your attention so that it says to say, do not be distracted by the things of this world, so to speak. What you eat, what you drink, and what, how you clothe yourself, and so on. It is your attention should not be focused there because these things will lead you away from attending to God's kingdom and to the things of his will. Do not worry. Do not be distracted by these other things like what you're eating and what you're drinking and what you're dressing yourself in. It's not that they're not important. They are important, but don't let them take away from your focus on God. Maybe the word for worry is, should, could be also translated concern. But worry is the, actually the, the best translation for this context and for so many things. But, but I want you to notice what is happening here, right? It is such a fabulous text, and it's so easy to, to misunderstand in so many ways. You know, remember when Jesus spoke the first time and, and he, he did this, this is part of the Sermon on the Mount, that the people who were listening to him, many of them were very poor. They're not like us. They're not even like the poorest among us. Some of them were not actually sure that they would eat that day or that week. They were not sure that they would be able to find a piece of cloth to cover their body. So it's a different sense. So they had all kinds of reasons to worry, and yet Jesus is giving them a very important lesson that comes directly to us with even stronger force than, than it may have been first been heard. He's giving us an introduction to the heavenly logic. And I want you to learn this, friends. If you do, it will change your life. It really will. Not that you hear and you agree with it, but if you really grasp it, it will change your life. What Jesus is doing, he's arguing from that which is higher to that which is smaller to that which is greater, to that which is lower. Now think about it, Jesus says. All the details of your life, how they can steal your perspective of reality. It's just what it is. Just, just think about it. Life and body, are they not more than food and clothing? Life and body is created and, and given to you, granted to you by God. You did nothing to get that. There's nothing you could do even to get it. So how is it, Jesus says, that that which you have been given the highest gets confused with the lower things, like what you put on your body and what you put in it? Is it not much more than that? And again, don't... Don't misunderstand. He is not trying to say that, that what we eat and, or how we clothe ourselves and all that is not important. He's simply saying, don't let that take your focus. That's what comes up, and I'm going to mention that a couple of times uh, through the sermon also. That's what comes up in verse 33 when he says, seek first the kingdom, then the other things will fall into place. I hope you understand the, the, the kind of the logic that Jesus is bringing forth. If you're to be concerned for anything, let your worries be focused on the true things that truly matter, that which is higher, which is greater, which is loftier. And then everything else be subordinate to that. 
Are we hearing this? Just think of it this way, right? When, when life was, was granted to you, you didn't know anything about it. You know, babies are not getting stressed about, I wonder who's planning my meal next time. They just don't. And we're equally helpless when God grants us life and when he takes it. And if you believe in that great truth about the great things in life, you can rest assured that God will also take care of the smaller things. That's it. God, who grants the greater things in life, through that proves that he cares for the smaller things as well. And I will bet that those of you who have walked with the Lord for a while, you will have to look back and say, yeah, that is my experience. When I worried the most, all of a sudden I see God was there all the time. That is what we learn. And when we get to worry, it's because we forget that. We get confused and other things are kind of taken over, so, so to speak. I don't know if you remember the story of, of God leading his people out of captivity in Egypt. It's described in a the, in the full book of, of Scripture called uh, the book of Exodus, the second book of the Bible. Some people, I still feel, you know, they, they know the story better from a movie they watched. But here's, here's how it goes. This is an incredible story, right? It's a story that, that kind of towers over all the other stories as the example, the typological expression, if you will, use a fancy word for that, but the example of how God take people out of bondage and into liberty. What happens? Well, God takes care uh, of all the great things. He's crushing the great empire of, of Egypt. He's opening the waters, and he's allowing his people to go out into freedom. And then they're there. And it doesn't take long until they move their focus from God to their own concerns, and they forget that the God who can open the waters and crush the empire of the world at that time and lead them out of their bondage, that he, with a snap of his finger, can give them manna and quail to live from while they're there in the desert. It is so easy to forget that he who can take care of the greatest things, that he will also take care of our smaller needs. And we wonder, why is that so hard for us to learn these days? And I think there are probably a multitude of reasons, but, but at least two that kind of stands out when you just think of it. And one is that we try to modernize Jesus' words and, and, and uh, just in the name of Jesus claim that, that God will not only take care of our needs, but he will take care of our wildest desires. And so when we don't have all the things that we think that Jones has or what we learn at TikTok that, that other people have or that we believe that, that the picture on Instagram really tells us the truth or, or other things, or we can't live up to that and God should have given us that and so we can't trust God, we've got to figure this out on our own. Of course, that's a lie and that was never what God promised. And so we begin to worry when we don't have everything that we can imagine. Then on the other side, we live in a time when we, from our earliest childhood, have been, been filled with the lie that, that everything that is in this world is the result of a kind of coincidental evolution that has only one governing principle, and that is that the most fit will survive. That's the purpose. And so everything you look at in life is that I have to be the most fit. I, it, it is all about pushing to get ahead. I, I got to do better than the others. And in that kind of experience of life, there's no, re, no room really for 
trust. There's no room for just putting your hand, your life in God's hand and trusting that his promises are true. It is all about how do I get to this point where I become the fittest, at least fit enough to survive in this world. But can I say this to you, friends? The strongest, most powerful contrast to this fear-filled type theory that has taken over is the truth from the Word of God that the one who has created the universe and everything that is in it will also care for it, that he loves his creation. He loves us and will care deeply for us. As Jesus says, seek first the kingdom of God and everything else will fall into place. The one who has taken care of all the great things in life will not forget about the smaller things. So praying to overcome worry focuses in on seeking God and learning to trust in him. I think we got it. Didn't we get it? Jesus just want to be totally sure. He does that a lot. And I kind of love that. Right? I say, no, nah, nah, I got it. And then he comes with the most pertinent, straightforward illustration. And he says, just look at the birds. Just look at the birds. You know, what, what, what about that? Well, look at the birds, what God has created. And he takes care of that. Like a, like a hummingbird, the smallest of all birds. It, it weighs like a tenth of an ounce, and it can stand still it can, better than any helicopter. It can move left, it can move right, it can move up, it can move down, and, and nothing can compare to what they do all while they're moving their wings 20 times a second. Oh, what, a, what about a peregrine falcon that dives 240 miles to catch its prey, the fastest bird ever? Think about it. Look at the bird, the migrating bird who had never learned uh, about maps, who, who were not able to plan their trips, and yet every, every year they go here in the summer and here in the winter and back here in the summer. No GPS that, you know, you buy from Google. None of that. Think about it. A swallow. Look at the birds. A swallow that is more nimble than any race car ever devised. You're flying like faster than anything, catching little insects in the air. And Jesus says, do you really think that God cares more for them than he cares for you? Really? Learn to trust that he who takes care of the great things in life will also take care of the smaller. That's the healing, friends, from worry. And he's not talking about some kind of blind optimism that just kind of do lazy fare. I don't need to care about life at all, right? Don't worry. Be happy. He is not trying to do that. There's not anything about that. What he's saying, and I want you to hear this, maybe write this down. What he's saying is there, there's a God who is wise, who is intelligent, who is interested, who is caring, who loves us, who is personal, and the one who says, trust me, place your life in my hand, and I will carry you. That's what he is saying. Can you trust God like that? There's a God who is wise, intelligent, caring, loving, one who knows your name, you can place your life in his hand. Focus 
on seeking him and all the other things that gives you worry will fall into place. You know, uh, I need to kind of finish up, but if you are one of these people that, that get inspired by other people who are not just speaking stuff, but actually living out what they say, take a look at Jesus. This Jesus who said those very words had a greater reason to be worried than anyone else ever. Contrary to all of us, he knew exactly what would come his way, what tomorrow would bring. He, he knew that it, it wouldn't be long until he would stand in the midst of his disciples and he would say, this bread that I'm now breaking is my body broken for you. He, he knew that when he was thirsty, it wouldn't be long until he would hang on that cross and he would cry out, I'm thirsty, and, and someone would stick, you know, a sponge with vinegar on it to his lips. He knew that it wouldn't be long until they would clothe him with ridicule and scorn and push a crown of thorn down over his head. He knew concerning his future. He knew that it wouldn't be long, and when it came to its fulfillment, it would end by someone nailing his wrist to a cross and thrusting a spear through his side. If there was anyone who had every reason in the world to worry, it was Jesus. But rather than worry, he rested his life in the hands of God, trusted God's promises. There's so much I can say about this. This is an incredible, incredible text. But let me just end by this verse, verse 30, where Jesus connects this whole issue of worry to the question of faith. And he's, he says, he, oh, ye of little faith. And that same kind of phrase that he used one time uh, also when he was with his disciples, they were in a boat, Jesus was there, and, and the storms was raging, and, and they were afraid that, that they would go under. And Jesus used that phrase again, oh, ye of little faith. You see, friends, faith is not just about being convinced about certain truisms about God, that you're saved in the end by Jesus' death on the cross. Faith is not about just kind of cleansing your teeth, saying, I trust in God, and I'm going to help him work it out. Faith is to live in the trust of God. The, the kind of trust that grows out of the recognition that he has your life in his hand. You don't have to live up to all these other things. He will carry you if you seek his kingdom first. I don't know how I can best illustrate that as the final point here. Do not be distracted by all the other things. Maybe this works. Imagine yourself in a giant concert hall, packed to the hilt. Everybody is there, sitting on all that, waiting for this incredible concert with this famous, famous conductor. And everybody's sitting out there, loud as it could be. Everybody yakking, you know, have you heard Susan said this? Well, Paul just bought this over there. You know, I wish I could have a car. Everybody's yakking about things. I can't believe she said that. You know how it goes, what you talk about for, before things begin? Everybody gets louder. Everybody gets louder because everybody needs to be heard. And they just yank yakking all over the place. And then the conductor comes in. And everything stops. Quiet as could be. All these little worries, all these little concerns that we had to share across the pews are now subordinated. Because the one on the stage is what we want to focus on. Yes? 
I hope you hear what the Spirit is saying with this. He is encouraging you to recognize that healing from worry comes when you seek him first and trust that the one who takes care of the great things in life also has you when it comes to the mundane things. Father, I ask that we can hear what you are saying. I realize this translates in so many ways to the specific life situations of each person who is here and each person who is listening. Father, if there's someone sitting in a living room or in a hotel room or in a, in a, a camping trailer or, or just watching from a phone someplace, each of us who are here in this building who recognize my life is filled with worries that I don't need to have if I trust it, that I just follow and focus on you and you will take care of my needs. Teach us, Lord, to trust you. There are some here, Lord, that needs prayer. And I know you are speaking to many of us because worry has become a daily thing in our lives. Give us the boldness to seek your face with a friend, a church staff member, in our own chambers. We need you, O Lord, to teach us to pray in this way. Not just because we have learned it, but because we trust you. We trust you, Lord. We don't want to just talk about faith. We want to experience what it means to place your life in God's hand and not worry about all these other things that come at us. So we ask, speak now. Dear Jesus, we ask in your name, by the power of your Holy Spirit, speak now. Amen.